I V M. The whole concept of grassroots plus collegiate sports is something which I think India has been missing for a while now. With 1.5 billion population, I think uh, there's far more to be sort of extracted from a sporting population standpoint than what we've done uh, over the years. Uh, it's fairly been a very cricket-dominated country ever since. The tapping of each state and each sport has not sort of uh, taken its true potential. Of course, both the federation and the corporate, uh, you know, influx is a cause of concern. But at the same time, I think a lot of uh, you know initiatives have come in from the government. A lot of corporate investors, promoters have actually put in their mind behind it and actually sort of tried to grow the sport. Hello and welcome to the Filter Coffee Podcast. The Indian sports market is estimated at roughly 5,894 crores, roughly around 800 million US dollars. This is according to a Group M report released this week. However, cricket makes up for 87% of all sponsorships. That is extremely skewed for any sport in any country. In the last 7-8 years though, there has been a bit of a change in this game. We've had many sporting leagues launched and some, like the Pro Kabaddi League, have succeeded as well. I think somewhere Kabaddi hit that sweet spot between a sport that is television friendly and also one that touched an emotional chord with India. Another sport which is equally indigenous to India, which I'm sure many of us grew up with, is Koko. My guest this week, Tenzing Niyogi, is trying to build a sporting league around it. Tenzing is the CEO of Ultimate Coco, a league which will hopefully be launched in November this year and will be available on Sony Television. Tenzing has been a career sports evangelist, having built successful business models around many sports, including golf, cycling, futsal, polo, and kabaddi. He's been the business head for golf in 10 sports. He was the head of Khalsa Warriors, the Punjab franchise in the World Kabaddi League. And also, most recently, the segment leader for sports advisory in Ernst & Young. I want to speak to Tenzing about what it takes to get a sports league off the ground, the challenges for non-cricket sporting leagues in this country, and most importantly, why he feels Coco will be a successful league, not just today, but a decade from now. Welcome to the Filter Coffee Podcast, Tenzing. How have you been doing? All well, Karthik. Thank you so much for inviting me. All well. So far, so good. Uh, the second wave, of course, doesn't make March a good friend to us. So Yeah, yeah I, I was just talking about this. March has um, not been a friend for a while now. Yeah. Not been a friend for a while, yeah. <laughs> Especially, you know, um, for, for you, though it's a temporary hurdle, I think the, uh, the kind of uh, plans you had must have... Uh, been deeply affected by by what is going on around us, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to start the episode with, uh, with a slightly larger perspective, Tenzing. Uh, you've been a, a career sports evangelist, I would say, right, right from pro sports broadcasting to consulting for for Ernst and Young, and of course you played a big role in in Kabaddi as well. If I were to ask you, what are the three big changes? Uh, two or three big changes that you want to see as far as sports in India is concerned, like, or, you know, from a, from a things you dream perspective, what will they be? Well, a uh, couple of them uh, certainly is the development of grassroots, which is one thing which I've been sort of uh, wanting to develop for a while now. The whole concept of uh, grassroots plus collegiate sports is something which I think India has been missing for a while now. With 1.5 billion population, I think uh, there's far more to be sort of extracted from a sporting population standpoint than what we've done uh, over the years. Uh, it's fairly been a very cricket-dominated country ever since. And from that perspective, I think, uh, you know, the tapping of each state and each sport has not sort of uh, taken its true potential. Of course, both the federation and the corporate uh, you know, influx is 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 a 
cause of concern. But at the same time, I think a lot of uh, you know initiatives have come in from the government. A lot of corporate uh, you know uh, investors, promoters have actually put in their might behind it and actually sort of try to grow the sport. So I think grassroots and collegiate sports is something which I would love to see uh, grow it. And uh, the second uh, bit would be, of course, the fact that. Uh, from a sporting infrastructure standpoint, I think we lag behind, right? Uh, having been, you know, done golf for over like 14 years, did the length and breadth. What I realized was there were about 267 odd courses in 2012. I remember that math. And out of which there was only one public course, for example, which is the DDA Lado Sarai in Delhi, right? By public, you mean anybody can go and play. You don't have to be a member. Yeah, That's anybody. I mean, right? Just go there, pay the green fees and start, uh, you know, using the driving range or start using the cost for that matter, right? So that sort of a facility. And then, of course, all the other scenarios in terms of indoor sports as well. The lack of, uh, for example, in Bombay, you don't have badminton courts around, you know. You don't have tennis courts around. So I'm saying the indoor facility for the lack of, you know, real estate becomes a big, big problem there. So I think uh, from an infrastructure standpoint, one is the stadiums which have been in India for a while now have always catered to large format events. Mm -hmm. So if you see most of the stadiums have typically capacity of either a two to 3,000 and then eventually heading up directly to 30,000, 40,000 plus. So there is a gap between the two. And I see a huge business potential there. So I think uh, infrastructure, that side of the story is sort of still untapped. And uh, thirdly, the idea of how sports leagues have sort of been cultivated in India uh, ever since IPL came in. I think the sporting culture resides in India, in my mind. So if you look at the Western part of the world, there is a culture where, uh, you know, a team has been supported, a franchise has been supported over generations in fact. And uh, we are fairly newbies in that. So I hope in our lifetimes, we get to see certain second or third generation following, uh, which will eventually give us a peace of mind saying that, okay, India is in good hands. You know? And for that, uh, you need to build some customized, economically viable, commercially sustainable structures as far as sports needs are concerned. So I think these three, uh, if done well, India should see itself as a multi-sport nation in the next uh, decade or two. Beautifully put in. Uh, I personally, you know, dream for that day when, when you know, we can, we'll have three generations of, uh, yeah. you know, franchise fans from a, from a family. That'll, that'll be beautiful to see, isn't it? You mentioned infrastructure and, uh, you know, I'm talking to you from Delhi, which of all the cities in India that I've lived in, I feel probably has the best uh, sporting infrastructure. Uh, you know, I live in South Delhi, so it's a little easier for this neighborhood than, than than others. And a lot of it has to do with the Sports Authority of India and uh, the DDA, which is the Delhi Development Authority. Right? There is a huge Sri Fort Stadium and then um, probably three or four different setups in under five kilometer drive from where I am. But the same is for some reason, and it's not still easy in Delhi, right? Even today, if I have to play right. uh, indoor badminton, I'll have to go to Sri Fort, I'll have to book the indoor right. stadium, and there's huge waiting times. Right. It's just not easy. By the time you get to actually playing, you've like lost interest only, right? But in other cities, it is not even this easy, right? Right. What are we missing? You, I, I got your point about uh, we always focus on large format games, but at a fundamental level, what is India doing differently or not doing correctly? I think the overall concept of uh, demand and supply works very beautifully here. Typically, when I got into sports marketing, there wasn't a career out of it, to be honest. We were pretty much the dark horses of the family, right? Saying that, uh, what are you going to do in sports? There's nothing. And those were the times when Mark Mascarinus was just about setting stone with 100 crore deal to Sachin Tendulkar and things were sort of just about booming with 96 World Cup and so on and so forth. Now, with the influx of so many leagues, the appetite coming in for the Indian consumer from an on-air standpoint, you know, they see so many events. I think the overall economy, when it grew, um, there was a lack of infrastructure in your metropolitans and submetros, basically. Um, so if you go to, a, say, a Pune, still a Balewadi is there, 
but not accessible to regular public. Mm. But if you come to Bombay, uh, what I see is the culture of sports is massive here, and even in younger generations. So uh, if if you do not have, which, which typically is the case with you know cities which are crammed up, for example, Kolkata and uh, Mumbai, with colonial structures, right? Uh, you know, a very leaned out city planning. You weren't left with too much of space to build up ground. So what we have adapted ourselves beautifully here. There is astroturf, and there are terraces which are being converted. The culture in in all these cities you see is very night driven. People come back from their work, and they are actually sort of trying to work day out with uh, with astroturf games in terms of yeah. football and cricket, yeah. and badminton and tennis, and so on and so forth. I think that is one side of the story, which in my mind is sort of taking shape right now as as India grows, but just the value which comes out of this in terms of a commercial structure, I think a lot of people have not dwelt into it from a builder standpoint. They would rather make more money building up a commercial structure to a residential structure vis-a-vis -vis a sporting scenario. So hence you see the lack of sports complexes all across. You mentioned Sai. I'm actually a Sai product from Kolkata. I started my cricketing career there. And I still remember how beautifully that was managed, right? Mm. Uh, the Sai DG those days was was a dynamic uh, fellow and uh, he really took care of that infrastructure i haven't visited the Sai delhi bit of it but i know that these are big structures which the government can actually uh, make public and uh, you know sort of give it away to to people and i did see a little bit of a difference when commonwealth 2010 was happening i remember um, I'm, I'm from hindu uh, in delhi university and I remember my cricket ground, and I call it my cricket ground because as the captain, this I literally owned it at, at one point in time from, from an emotional stroke, professional standpoint. It was converted into a rugby ground, right, for Commonwealth Games. Uh, and then there was a huge facade given in from a dressing room standpoint and all of that. And then suddenly there was this discussion happening that, you know, they would open it up to the public for people to come in. Delhi University eventually um, actually has only one grass court in tennis, which was Hindu. Uh, but again, it never came out to the public from a UGC standpoint to a Delhi University standpoint. So I think, you know, the, the return on investment from a sports complex is not that high when people are not given the opportunity. And it's a chicken and egg story. The day you start giving opportunity to people, more people come and explore that, those areas. And then eventually, over a course of time, you start making money, right? And it has to be a sustainable business model because managing a sports complex needs a lot of, of uh, you know, overlays to it. There's a lot of operational expenses which, which comes into the picture. I have a so, dumb question in what you said, uh, Tending. Huh? You, 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 talk, you spoke about return on investment. And I always wanted to, to ask an expert this question, is that whether it is Chen Line, you know, where we had... Uh, I think the Afro Asian Games some time back, and uh, uh, that that was the first time uh, that we had a Olympic size pool which was available. You know that, that was right. built, right. Uh, and then you spoke about the Commonwealth Games. A lot of facilities, even in in Surrey Fort, uh, especially in shooting and uh, badminton, were sort of given a facelift around that time. We seem to be moving from one international event to another international event to sort of build our. Uh, urban sports infrastructure yeah. piece. Yeah. Is there no other way? And, and when you say uh, return on investment, this is part B to that question, which is, you know, when I lived outside India, there were courts where I played tennis and badminton, which were never used for any international event. How are they surviving? So it's, it's funny that you say Afro Asian Games. I think that the first Afro Asian Games happened in Hyderabad. And I remember Chandra Babu Naidu created the overall structure outside the city and Gachibauli Stadium came about. Yeah. Right. And uh, it was state of the art. I remember uh, just looking at it, fabulous stuff. And you rightly said, we've been building our infrastructure capabilities and prowess there. And then from one big multi event to the other, and uh, the infrastructure goes down to dumps, unfortunately. So, my point is that if you do not open these areas for the public, the government has to take a stance where you need to sort of give opportunities to public to come around and start playing and utilizing. The return on investment typically happens, for example, any private player, for example, Transstadia in my mind, which comes to my mind in uh, Ahmedabad. 
they've built up a huge, huge base, right? And it's uh, it's capable of holding multi uh, events. So, for example, you could do a, maybe a pro kabaddi league, and very next day you could do an ARMR concert. And that is where the return on investment comes in. Of course, now we're talking COVID times, but pre-COVID times, things were beautifully managed there. But individual areas in in India, I haven't seen it because I think by and large we've never had that sporting culture. Mm. And as I said, you know, eventually the state government has to take that initiative with private builders to pick it up, pick up a place and build it into a sort of a sports complex. You said City Fort. A City Fort eventually has been making more money in concerts than sports. Right? And and yeah. that that's how it is. But if you look at a Saket sports complex, for example, mm. it has been it has been successfully surviving because of the membership facility. But it was built a long time back. It was built in the 80s. You know, and if you see today, most 90% of these sports complexes have been built in the 80s. There have been no new developments because of the fact that economy grew and that's what I was saying that people found more revenue, more earnings, more, more profitability from a residential store, commercial brick and mortar than building up a sports complex. And I think that mm-hmm. is a mindset change that we should, we should be looking at. Fair point. I'm going to quickly switch from the larger sports narrative to, to something that has probably taken a lot of your waking hours in the last few years, which is which is Coco. What is your relationship with the game? Have you, have you did you play Coco growing up? No, I haven't. To be honest, I haven't. Right. Uh, I saw Coco. I'd of course known about it, but uh, while I was part of a deal, while mm-hmm. I was you know forging this deal, while I was with EY, um, almost nine months into the legal agreement, one of my colleagues said that. Uh, have you seen Coco? And I said, no, I haven't. So I went on to <laughs> YouTube and I saw a few glimpses and I was absolutely mesmerized. So no, I haven't played Coco. Hey, but in research for this episode, I was just reading up on the history of Coco and it's, it seems fascinating. Uh, clearly like Kabaddi, and there's a lot of parallels to, to Kabaddi. Uh, like Kabaddi, it's a very uh, indigenously Indian, quintessentially Indian sport, which, which had all its, its origins here. Uh, seems like uh, uh, it, it dates back to 1914, and a lot of it has seemed to have happened around Maharashtra, Pune side. I think the the Deccan Gymkhana Club in Pune seems to have been the place where it originally right. started, and then in 38, it seems to have moved one step forward. You know, when Akhil Maharashtra, I'm going to say this correctly, Sharirik Shikshan Mandal. Uh, organized a, a zonal sports meet at, at Akola, where you know it seemed to have uh, created a lot of great response. And then I also read up about 1949 or so, where we took it outside uh, India as an exhibition sport. Berlin um, Olympics, 1936, I think. Yeah. Right, right. So, but it, it didn't really catch the imagination of a lot of people. And then finally, a lot seems to have happened in Andhra and Hyderabad area. Where in '55 the Akhil Bharatiya Coco Mandal was established and uh, the first ever championship sort of happened, uh, and then of course in '82 it became, I think it was part of the the Asian Games, right? Um, so it seemed to have had a lot of histories where the game itself seems to have evolved, evolved, um, yeah. you know, in in many different ways. My question after all of this uh, uh, this, this history is, uh, why do you feel? Coco is a promising league as far as India is concerned. Why are you convinced? Wow. Okay, great question. <laughs> so, historically, what we've seen in India is the fact that, and I hate to say this, but India has been in favor of team sports. Mm. Right? Uh, if you look at uh, the journey of sports in India, typically when it started off with cricket in 83, and then, of course, hockey prior to that with Dhan Chand, uh, the football mania with Mohan Bagani's being on Mohan Sporting, you know, FCT Fagwada, all these guys with playing the I League those days, uh, they've all been team sports predominantly. Uh, the only few athletes then we knew was Kamlesh Mehta from TT or Tusha and Shiny Wilson from Athletics and, you know. Uh, Probably one or two in tennis, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prakash Padukone and so a couple of these guys, but they were there, of course, and in the media was a different story. But historically, when we started viewing sports per se, uh, we started following a lot of team sports. So when I saw Coco as a Mitti Ka Khel, 
which was sort of as indigenous as it gets, was played across India. As you rightly said, there are pockets where it is largely played, even with more fanfare. But predominantly, Coco has been played in every state. Yeah. Uh, I was I was pleasantly surprised when the Federation actually told me that there's a large population which plays in Jammu, which is bigger than maybe Odisha. Right. Now, that's a fabulous piece for me, right? Uh, Jammu and Kashmir. So, from a Coco standpoint, I think team sports was an important part, which actually checked the first box. Second was that with the influx of pro Kabaddi in 2014, we realized the fact that close knit arena sports and fast paced arena sports actually made a lot of difference while it was produced well. Because when you watch it on television, it's not the 5,000 people that have come to the stadium is what you're catering. You're actually catering to the 100 million people who are going to watch it on television. Mm. And for that, a high-speed arena sports with close-up cameras worked wonders. That was number two. Number three, the fact is that we've always loved as a nation bringing in gold for ourselves. Uh, if you look at cricket, eight testing uh, playing nations, but uh, India was still number one and we loved it. And this is a cricketer talking to you, right? Um, Kabaddi, seven nations playing, but we still get gold. Coco again at the same time, right? So the point is that with Asian games, Southeast Asian games, Coco has been getting gold ever since. And I think from that perspective, it was fabulous for, you know, Coco to sort of. How many countries up. play Coco besides India, roughly? All South nations. And uh, there are about four to five countries who are playing it properly at this point in time, which is uh, England, Iran, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, and uh, Korea. So uh, there's, there's been a Korean team which actually came and played a test match in Indore. And when I say Koreans, I say proper Koreans. And when you say test match, you, you, you're still in Coco, right? We are still in Coco. Uh, okay. it, it, I think uh, it was called a test match. Uh. Yeah, it is. It is actually this exact format as a cricket test match. You have first innings, and then you have a break, and then you have second innings. And there are times when you actually get into a draw in Coco, and then there is a sudden death, which happens. It's it's mm -hmm. quite a compelling format from that perspective. It is compelling, and I love the the point about it being pan Indian because um, you know growing up, Coco was was all around me. You know whether it is. Uh, uh, in, in Chennai or wherever, whichever city I, I traveled, I knew friends. Um, we were not really far from Coco in any part of of India. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I, I I have a I have a question on the television part of it, but I'll I'll just come to that in a bit. Um, but uh, talk to us about a little bit about the journey from when you must have thought that hey, this is a nice idea, and this should probably be you know, the next quest for the big league. When did that idea happen and what has been the journey since then? I'm glad you asked me this question because it's it's got a sort of a lovely story to it. I was an EY then, heading uh, sports advisory practice. And we were doing multiple things. We were doing, uh, you know, the gamification and hot start to some fan engagement models and EPL clubs to developing smart stadiums and LATAM and so on and so forth. And there was this thought in my mind that, you know, we should sort of get a new league in India and which sport could it be? And then one of my colleagues actually said, why don't we look at Coco? It's so, okay, fair enough. And uh, started doing a lot of R&D on that. And uh, went into the Indian Olympic Association, tried meeting up, sold the idea, but it did not fly through then. While I was there, I was also managing a league called UBA, which is the United Basketball League. This was owned by this gentleman called Tommy Fisher, who was the fourth candidate in the Trump government to build the Mexican war. He was a builder, all right? And he had come to India to actually sell American football. And he chanced upon the investor who owned UBA. So he said, okay, fair enough. Let me start off a league in India, United Basketball. Now, he was already done for about three seasons in India. And... Uh, my then boss in EY said that, uh, you know, there weren't too many things happening in sports. So he said, Tenzing, would you like to sort of go and meet this person in BSC, uh, Bombay Stock Exchange, who sits there, and see if uh, something could be done with Tommy Fisher and or the Doklam Wall in Arunachal. Okay. Wow. Because he's a builder. 
And those were the days where the government was looking at, you know, building a wall, if you remember those days then. So I said, I've got nothing to do with it. Uh, <laughs> it's got nothing to do with sports. He said, Tenzing, please do it for me once. I said, okay, fair enough. So I went to BSC and uh, had this lovely lunch with this gentleman there. And while talking, uh, he said, Ki, sir, khara kaisa laga? I said, oh, chai. So he said, uh, sir, aapko pata hai, aap, you know, I work for so-and-so political party. And uh, so I said, okay, fair enough. And so I said, would you by any chance know Mr. Sudhan Shumitra? who happened to be the KKFI president, who still is the president. And I wasn't getting an input to him. I wanted to take this concept to the Federation and tell them. So he said, yeah, I, I know him. I said, okay, so, you know, I have an idea. I've built this league. Why don't you take this league and sell it as your, okay? And if you do that, let me know if Mr. Mittal wants to meet me. And uh, maybe then I can take it through. I said, okay, fair enough. This was a Friday when I went to BSC. He went ahead and on Sunday evening, I remember I was sitting and he said, he calls me up and said, Sir, my thing is done, Mr. Mittal. He wants to meet you on Thursday. Ko. Uh, and I was happy, of course, because I had, I had penetrated that wall of bureaucracy. So Thursday, I flew down from Bombay to Delhi. I went and met Mr. Mittal, fabulous gentleman. We are very close friends now, of course. He said that, Tenzing, what are you here for? I said, you, know, you want to build a league? Apparently, there was already a league which was being sold to an investor when I visited him that particular day. Mm. And uh, it was quite the time, uh, which is 16th of April it was. And I went there and he said, okay, fair enough. So uh, how much can you bring on the table? I gave him a number. And uh, I closed my laptop and I walked away from that meeting. He said, waiter, how much do you want? I gave him a figure from EY standpoint. And I left. He said, you have three weeks to bring in an investor. I said, okay, fair enough. And uh, a week and a half passed by, I didn't have any investor with me. After that, I sent a few WhatsApp messages. Um, Amit Berman happened to be one of them. And he responded back immediately. He said, okay, I'll be interested in picking up, a, you know, taking a look at the business model. So can you send me the business model and the financial model? I gave it to him. I think within 15 days, I took Mr. Ahmed Berman to meet Mr. Sudan Shumitan, and the deal was closed. It was one of the largest commercial deals in non cricketing history of Indian sports. It's an amazing story. Let me get this straight. You went to broker a conversation around a wall in Doklan, and <laughs> in the middle of it, you slipped in this. Uh, yeah. uh, and then sort of uh, set up this, this, this meeting with Mr. Mittal, which is just. Which is very, very, very smart of you. But, you know, I'm assuming when you walked into this um, this meeting itself, you you were sort of convinced that this should be a league in India. You, you were sort of convinced, you, you were seeing the vision yes. even before you walked into this meeting, right? Can you tell me, if, if I can ask you, uh, what are some of the reasons why you felt this should be? There are There is no dearth of... Uh, grassroots level sport, which are very traditional in India. Right? Why, why, why did you feel this way about Coco? The logic there was what I mentioned again. The fact that India was looking at a fast-paced, you know, they had gotten used to it, thanks to Kabaddi and a couple of other sports as well. And I believe that, you know, when there was a gentleman with you know, the stature of Mr. Berman trying to back this up, the business model fell in at the right place. We We knew that the sport had all its sort of nuances to become a big hit from a team sport to a fast-paced sport and we could make it an arena sport. There was a time when when we did the dipstick in terms of, you know, consumer insights to a certain level where because there was no data available on, on Coco. It still isn't, if you see. There was no linear broadcast data there. But we did a little bit of a dipstick and we also understood that, fun fact, Coco actually enjoys an equivalent or more female stroke women player population and one of the only sports in india which actually enjoys that compared to any other sport right and it was penetrated across the uh, you know the gentry which i called bharat so to say you know the hinterland which is which is where it is absolutely uh, you know it's huge fan following so there was this one perspective when i remember there's a city called ichil karanji right next to nagpur where coco is is equivalent to what cricket is to India. 
Wow. Uh, so in the evenings, if you go during, you know, the Coco Championships, you will find close to about 35, 40,000 people surrounding a clay court, which is not even arena style seating. So, you know, people are standing one next to the other with a five rupee ticket price under halogen lamps with a price money of 1, 1. 1.5 lakhs. It is unreal to see that sort of a madness for sport. Um, I remember one of my colleagues actually went ahead and saw it and he sent a few pictures. I got in touch with that federation there. Because Maharashtra itself has three federations, associations inside Maharashtra. That's the sort of magnanimity of the, you know, the popularity of the sport. And uh, there were some sky shots, I remember. I still have it in my phone. Those sky shots were unreal. And I remember telling myself that if we could by any chance convert this into a on-air spectacle, this is going to be the biggest hit in India. Because just the way people were playing this on ground, there was a lot of emotion coming in from the sky dives which were happening, from the pole dives which were happening. So I, had, I hadn't seen it till then, right? Uh, I did not know how Coco looked or felt. But all I saw was people coming in for this one particular sport. And then I knew that, of course, this sport was as widely sort of entrenched into the Indian masses from a Satna, Jabalpur, Riva to a Ludhiana. Everybody knew the sport, right? Uh, so it just made sense then. And the day I actually saw the sport, I remember being completely astonished by the speed of play. In my mind, Karthik, this is by far the fastest sport that India has ever seen. Indoor, by far. And when I say that, I'm sure all of us, we've seen NBA live, I've seen ice hockey in North America and Montreal live, yeah. which, is, which is basically a puck which is playing, right? And then you have the players. But it's all about the emotion, the way they are playing, you know, the way the physicality of those players come in and throw them into the carbon fiber boards, right? Similar is the case with an NBA, which is it's the fans which actually build up the sport. But from a speed of play, pure speed of play from a discipline standpoint, Coco is by far faster than, right? And when I saw that, I, I just imagined that, you know, there was a time when I had done almost 14, 15 years in golf, which was possibly the slowest sport in television. <laughs> Cut to Coco, which in my mind today would be by far the fastest sport, one of the fastest sport in the world, but by far the fastest sport that India has ever seen. So there was a happy headache where, uh, you know, the broadcasters actually came to me and said that Dada, shayad isko slow karna <laughs> So I said, that, that, that's, that's something new. I'd never heard that. Right. And, and these were the reasons why I believe that, you know, sport is going to grow. Also the fact that I remember when I met Mr. Mittal, he's a gentleman with, with a foresight. He's very dynamic. And he wants to do and wants to contribute to the sport from a technology standpoint, from a production standpoint you know, from a player data standpoint. And I've dealt with multiple federations in my career. I must say that this is, you know, one of the few federations where I've worked with that much of foresight and, you know, advancement in their thinking, saying that, yeah, we want to make this uh, a representative sport in Asian Games and eventually make it to a, almost 50 countries where countries play it and then making it eligible for Olympics eventually. And that's the agenda, right? The larger agenda that it, it should be part of Olympics while we're taking baby steps. But the idea I remember in my first meeting was the fact that, you know, the vision was larger than life and for which the stepping stone was India. And while it was conceptualized, the game was born in India, I think it was just, you know, sort of justified that we, we do a league of this sort and, uh, and do some format changes. And that's where the whole story of a little bit of format change, a little bit of tweak uh, started creeping in. And uh, I think Amit Bauman then sort of, uh, you know, started sharing our vision together and said, yes, I'm, you know, I'm ready to bankroll it. And uh, the rest is history. I think we are, we're looking at a 2021 launch. Brilliant. And, and, and I can feel it as a sports fan, right? Um, as, as you explain this, because uh, to me, I certainly agree on the speed of it. It also seems like to me, it's a very physical sport. Uh, but at the same time, there is a fair bit of strategy in it as well, right? And, and different teams will will interpret it differently, um, and you can innovate and create very well. Both of which, you know, probably are things which which make, makes an NFL an NFL, right? There, there is a yeah. an extremely physical sport, but there is also a whole lot of uh, strategy, strategy to it, massive strategy behind. Yeah, yeah. 
and uh, and the fact that this is uh, everybody remembers coco uh, in india everybody would have seen it or probably one generation away from 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 seeing it in school uh, so that really works but to me the reason i feel very excited about it as you explained this is also it's a very simple game to understand isn't it and like uh, test match cricket for which you probably need about an hour and a half if you have to explain this to someone from right. uh, say latin america right uh, this is very simple to understand you, you watch this for 2 minutes you know the game and uh, you would fancy yourself playing it so i'm assuming not only as a as a league in india but even as a as a as a global game i think it it must be easy to proliferate right do you feel so yes yes i think it's 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 a great point that you've picked up in india again if you were to look at catching the eye of the masses you have to be a simple concept anything right right from pocket wallets to upi to everything that we are seeing has to be very simply processed uh similar is with sports so the reason why i believe that you know of course kabaddi got ahead uh was the fact that it was a very simple sport in the day you have two halves it's a small mm-hmm. court and you go to the other half and touch and you come back similar is the case with coco and uh i couldn't agree more because that is something which is going to work wonders with the 8 to 15 year olds which is where you get to know that okay there are three people who are running and nine people who are trying to catch them it's a simple case of pakadam pakadai right as simple as and that's where the game finishes literally right so uh, from a technical standpoint i think it's very easy to explain in midst of all of that what has happened beautifully over the evolution of coco from in the last 60 years is that somewhere when we were kids coco was designed for girls and kabaddi was designed for boys in our schools if you remember for for some of the part it was quite and i i meet a lot of women and men who still can you know we played kabaddi we we heard of coco of course because the girls were playing but during the course of time of 60 years somewhere it evolved so beautifully to become a very manly sport from a speed standpoint from a physicality standpoint so the concept of skydive came in now what are skydive skydive is essentially if you remember 92 world cup or 96 world cup or jonty roads doing those skydives that happens every 90 seconds in coco now mm. these guys fly in the air 2 and a half meters and going almost like a meter and a half and touch them bang they fall in and get up and go it is super humanish now that happened with the influx of pole dives which happened where they thrust their chest and turn in a pivot which is which is fabulous to watch now when that all of that happened clubbed with a simple concept of catch catch what we used to say when we were kids made a lot of sense for it to become a television spectacle and the growth story of this sport is also sort of taken shape now where i remember that indian cricket team used to play coco sport as a warm up sport right oh, okay Yeah so I remember this is article where Yuvraj Singh actually fractured his ankle or twisted his ankle because of coco because of the weight was but there've been a lot of companies who have actually approached us over the last two years for example the Australian High Commission got in touch with us to get coco as part of a warm up sport in Australia to excite the indigenous community there so there's a there's a lot happening from that perspective from the simplicity of the sport to making a few changes which will make the sport uh, you know a larger consumed sport i agree yeah yeah and and also you don't have to invest any money and and I, it, it's great that you moved from golf where you have to probably sell your kidney to uh, to be able to play the game to to coco <laughs> where you can just get up and play right um, uh, it is beautiful but you know uh, what you said uh, takes me back to to kabaddi right and um, i've been mean, you know I, i think it's safe to say that post 2010 sport in india has been very different we are looking at leagues in a very very professional uh, manner probably even later probably post 2013 14 i guess but many leagues have not been able to flourish and when i say flourish i'm not necessarily comparing it with ipl we all know it's a very different piece but even getting the and both of us are in in, in sports marketing so you know what i'm talking about there are leagues today which are extremely popular in india who get a a uh, front chest uh, sponsor probably after the league has begun right there are teams where 
that is happening why do leagues fail in india and uh, what did kabaddi get right that other leagues have not gotten right see there are a few reasons to it in my mind uh, one is that i've always believed that not every sport can become a league anyway right you have to have the sense of spectacle and it has to be a compelling on air sport for it to sort of grab the eyeballs for which it has a few prerequisites as we have always mentioned it has to be a fast paced sport it has to entrail the family uh, it has to be so and i think there's this interesting anecdote i remember from pro kabaddi league where when pkl had started uh, one of the team owners was sitting with uh, legendary kapil dev at his home and there was some one day match which is going on and there were these two kids who were running around in the house and said paji asked that uh, bit score kitna hua and they went back and they said ki 20 for 2 or whatever and an hour passes by it's uh, 8:30 pm and he says bit score batana ek baar fir se and they go back and they said that uh, it's 30 23 so they said ye kaun sa score bata rahe अंकल कबड्डी शुरू हो गया ना सो दॉन्सेप्ट वेर आई थिंक द सक्सेस ऑफ एनी स्पॉट इज द फैक्ट दैट इफ यू कैन एंगेज दैट एट टू फिफ्टीन ईयर ओल्ड फ्रॉम अ कंपेलिंग स्टैंड पॉइंट आई थिंक दैट इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट द अदर एरिया वेर आई बिलीव दैट लीग्स इफ सॉर्ट ऑफ यू नो देर बिन मल्टीपल लीग्स देर वॉज अ टाइम वेन देर ऑलमोस्ट फोर्टीन लीग्स इन इंडिया हैपनिंग बट you know the financial model of any particular league is so important it has to be viable for the franchisees to actually invest into it end of the day what does the franchisee look the franchisee is actually looking at that you know the league should not earn money before we do a and b the sustenance of this particular business should be over two decades where there's an exit from a valuation standpoint okay there was you know everybody says that okay we should look at it from a pnl standpoint you do break even eventually but sports marketing in india is not that lucrative from a break even standpoint right it's more of a valuation game you might make money but we are not exactly like us where we are earning millions in terms of merchandise and we are earning millions in terms of ticketing and all of that it's largely based on the central pool what we have seen from ipl pkl all the isl and all the other leagues which you've seen the central pool revenue which comes from the sponsorship makes it you know more viable for the franchises and from from that perspective i think what any stakeholder looks at is firstly who is the team what is the team which is actually backing this particular product how much of this product will actually penetrate the masses uh, because that is where money is like so while the bharat so to say will consume coco in my mind uh, the money is will coming from the silver lining of the metropolitans right and those that is where the ad sales comes in that's where the revenue line item starts falling into place and from that perspective i believe that sport which are sort of sold and uh, built from from a pan india standpoint and uh, have that sort of engaging format behind it will always make more sense uh, and and i would not like to sort of name a few leagues but the point is that a lot of leagues have actually wanted to make a quick buck here and there which doesn't work you know you have to create a sustainable model which shows a 20 year journey a minimum which is what brings me to my first point where i said the legacy has to be left and people have to start believing in your vision your stakeholders have to start believing in your vision the fact that yes you are building something which stays for at least 20 years and you know that there will be an exit scenario where you can sell a minority and make some money okay right. on that note we'll take a very quick break and be right back on the filter coffee podcast Hello, everybody. Welcome to another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We'd like to thank the sponsors on the network this week: thewholetruthfoods.com, Sierra, PayPal, and Cred. We thank you all for your support. Tune into the note where Maru Kanaya talks to Dr. Bipin Joshi about the second wave of COVID. He calls it no less than World War III. On the Habit Coach, Ashton was joined by Yoshita Dave, who is a sex educator and intimacy coach. On Pesa Vesa, Anupam Gupta was joined by Amit Thakkar and Hiral Jain of Market Pulse Technologies, and they talked about trading in Indian markets. 
All Things Policy by the Takshashila Institute had on board Mihir Mahajan and Pranay Kotasthane to talk about the recent changes in the Indian intellectual property front. You should definitely check out the Cyrus Says episode with Ace Casting Director Mukesh Chabra. They discussed some of his best work. We also had Ira Mukoti, who has authored various books on history and mythology from a female gaze. The IPL season is in full swing and we have Edges and Sledges in English and Kale Niti in Hindi if you want to check out cricket content. Really, really great conversations on both of those shows. Do check those out. And with that, let's get you back to your show. Welcome back to the Filter Coffee podcast. We're speaking to Tenzing Niyogi, CEO of Ultimate Coco. You know, you spoke about the horizontal dives, you know, uh, from a from a jaunty perspective. Um, and uh, I think... I think all sport at some level is mythology, right? And if we can create mythology, if we can create those big heroes, you know, whether it is the jaunty dive or whether it is the Jordan uh, leap, all of them, you know, that is that is when you create a fan, right? But a lot of it also has to do with the adaptability for television, right? And, you know, we know that the yellow of the tennis ball or the fact that uh, the football has a black and white squires to it or had in for black and white TV, uh, the white ball cricket, they're all modifications we made in the sport so that television viewing becomes interesting, right? Right. And uh, to me, I feel some of the reason, you know, while, while table tennis is such a approachable sport in India, the reason I feel it is not really taken off is also, I don't know if table tennis is a, is a great television spectacle. Right? It's very right. difficult to, to right. appreciate maneuvers there, right? Uh, how, are, how are you thinking in terms of uh, uh, Coco as a TV sport? So, you know, as you were talking, in my mind, I'm thinking a lot of slow-mo uh, images in terms of the, the player jumping, leaping, etc. But in your mind, how are you, how are you thinking that? So that is one thing which has sort of been one of our prerequisites in terms of our efforts going in. In Jan, we started off this sort of sports science camp, right? A performance, high performance training camp with 150 athletes, top athletes. And... Uh, when we sort of wrapped it up in February, we did a four-day league-like simulation scenario in Indra Gandhi Indoor Stadium, Delhi, which is where we got lights, camera, action. Or all the, and there were two production companies which came to pitch to us. The idea of that was the fact that no other league in my mind has actually done that pre-going into air. To understand the right camera angles, the biggest problem which Coco, which is one of my pain points right now, is the fact that the game is too fast. And as you rightly said, to capture that and making it into a viewer-friendly sport on television is very important. So to capture the right essence of a skydive, because the court is rectangle in shape, it's almost three times the size of a Kabaddi court. And the skydive can happen anywhere, right? Now, you cannot possibly put a buggy cam, for example, because there is a health and safety hazard issue there. Because they, when they dive, they go dive and they skid on the mat and get up, right? So from that perspective, we actually tried all camera angles from uh, we did try a buggy cam to understand the lower camera uh, piece when while a person. So, for example, whenever you see in a Superman flying or an Iron Man flying, if you ever notice the camera is below his belly. Have mm-hmm. you ever noticed that Superman is at least half in your screen or even above your TV screen? It's because we see the low angle. And you always feel that it's larger than life. That's the superhumanish piece. We've tried to capture that with, with skydives. We are trying to create a rabbit hole in the poles and put a GoPro there to actually capture the pole dives and also understand the vocabulary which goes in during the match because it's a very interesting vocabulary. There's a lot of exchanges which happen which we want to capture, of course, beep out a few. But that is that is very important from from that perspective. So there's a lot of technology which is innovation which is going in. For example, the pole in Coco is normally used as shisham wood. Now there is a scenario where the shisham wood, if it is kachi lakadi, for example, then there are times when I remember we did something in Talkatora and there were these the court was laid out and there were these two wood which were there. I came and the match started around nine thirty. I must have come at around about 10.30 and I saw one of the one of the poles was actually bent like this, right? It was sort of, it had taken a shape of C. And I asked the Federation, I said, what is wrong with that pole? He said, sir, wo mud gaya hai because of the pivot and the energy which is used on the pole. That's the amount of energy which is used by the players while taking a turn, right? I was mesmerized. I said, wow, so what is the deal there? 
and uh, the scenario was that if you have to use kachi lakadi which is dry wood but now what we are looking at is we are looking at carbon fiber poles so if you're looking at carbon fiber poles we are creating a rabbit hole inside that which will eventually try and capture the zigzag movement of a player a chaser while he evades attack essentially so that is one side of the story the other side of the story what we did was uh, an interesting piece is that uh, we were trying to sort of uh, coco is played with nine players right mm. who actually chase out a defender three defenders are there now while we did that we also were looking at influxing artificial intelligence and machine learning from a perspective that is there a way that we can negate human error and because it's fun fact it's one of the only tag sports in the world come to think of it right from a run and chase model perspective right so when person a touches person b how do you know that someone's touched it's of course super slow mo which is a typical usage of technology or the central referee will tell you what's happening we wanted to negate that so we started uh, with a top cam a nine cam shoot three cameras on either side of the court six seven eight on the pole and nine on the top when we put that camera at a height of 52 feet we could not get a complete view of the court the court was that big so then we had to adapt ourselves so cut to we went to indira gandhi stadium and indira gandhi stadium by far is one of the highest stadiums in india from an infrastructure standpoint right so we had trusses there going up to 60 feet light trusses going on to 60 feet we said okay we'll put it put the camera at 60 feet and see we still couldn't capture it now the fun part there was that indira gandhi stadium was just polished the flooring was just polished and we weren't getting permission to dig holes because coco needs the poles to be dug on the ground right so we had this one hole there which is meant for a volleyball pole the diameter of that was 2 and a half inch okay hmm. the very next pole which we were supposed to dig uh, for a 19 player uh, we finally got the permission but we got to know that indira gandhi stadium's base the area underneath surface is air you don't have anything there wow okay. so if you dig the pole there's no energy to hold it so it's a false flow yeah part of it is false flow so we could not dig it we got the permission but we could not dig it because the, there's nothing to hold the pole but there was this one hole there which is calculating to 17 to 17.3 meters which exactly made it a seven man game hmm. so what we did was we dug that and we shortened the the format from nine man to seven man now <laughs> and it was it, you know it, there's a saying that man proposes god disposes right so so danshu mithil and myself were discussing how do we shorten the sport to make it more viewer friendly on television and cut to the igi date we got that 17.3 meters is actually like a couple of inches more than what a seven man would take but that's okay we got that done the court looked smaller the top camera started capturing it the ai ml started recording close to 800 minutes of live footage that footage as we speak is right now at the lab the machine is getting trained so if karthik is a coco player and he enters a field of play ever you will always be tagged by a unique number forever in your career and if tenzing nyogi tags karthik we will get to know that tag in real time or deferred real time of 3 seconds now what that brings is that it brings fabulous opportunities from a tv production standpoint right one is that we can reduce the number of referrals which are going in mm. we also get the right amount of data which helps in auctions and player drafts increasing the business viability from a stakeholders perspective that if team a is putting money on tenzing nyogi who is a good player because of his data which has been captured by ai ml now and you know my data as to how many feet have i jumped in every match what is my length of the dive how many kilometers have i ran all data metrics complete all that you can imagine everything has been captured which then translates into commercial value for a player for a stakeholder and more importantly it gives us the feasibility to create magic on air 
So with that data, we can either light up the pools, whether it's green or red from an out or a not out perspective. We can actually eventually make maybe the player vanish out of thin air when he gets out. There can be magnanimous opportunities once you get that data. Now, issue in India has always been that you've never had that data in real time. So it's an POC stage. We've invested into that particular piece. And let's see where that goes. But that's the amount of inventions and innovation that we are planning to do with Ultimate Co. That's the most fascinating sports story, hands down, I've heard in a long, long time. Uh, uh, so, so this data that you're talking about, I'm assuming is eventually what will bring in the money ball sort of a moment, right? Like players will get traded and not traded. This is the batting average equivalent or a strike rate equivalent of, of, of Coco. Yes. Um, and I love uh, <laughs> how you brought this down from 9 to 7, which is uh, probably the television innovation for this sport that you're bringing in, right? yeah. which, is, uh, which yeah. also suits the the length of the of the play itself. Fabulous. I know, you know, from a uh, from a reality perspective, uh, you probably wanted to be up and about even uh, as early as February this year in terms of taking the league on ground. Talk to us a little bit about uh, where you are and how far are you from the first event, and how have things been overall in the last year. I think uh, I'll answer your second part first. Uh, 2020 has been a difficult year for all of us, uh, you know, due to the pandemic. But what we certainly sort of uh, worked out as, as as a league was the fact that um, Coco is a very physically demanding sport. And if you see the physicality of these players, it's very different to any other sport, right? They're very lean machines. And even the age group which comes in, which plays Coco, is, is 18 to 26. You know, that's the age group where they're at their prime. So there was this thought midway through 2020 was from a physicality standpoint as to how do you keep the players fit. And that thought sort of brewed and eventually got concluded in a high-performance training camp at Manav Rachna in Faridabad, where I said that, you know, we had called in the 150 top athletes. When that started off, uh, we believed that, of course, you know, uh, there was a fabulous story which was big built because now not only do we have the uh, you know, the AI ML data, plus there's a sporting sports dashboard, which is being created from a scoring standpoint. And that data will be, you know, will be captured during the nationals. But we also have a sports science data now uh, from a before after perspective, right? For all the top 150 athletes, which will be given away to all the stakeholders, franchisees from a player booklet standpoint, saying that, okay, Ram Nayak from Nashik, he was this in terms of his physicality, stamina, his injury, the way he reacts to a co, what is the lag time between once he gets a go and when he gets up, what is his distance of capture, how much he, how much has he ran and so on and so forth. All of that will be now captured into a Bluefoot docket which will be given. So while this was happening, there was a parallel process with the broadcaster which is also happening with us. Right? And I think that is one of the key ingredients for a success factor of uh, any league in India, what you see. The relationship with a broadcaster stroke OTT, linear broadcast plus OTT is, is a very, very important component. Um, we've got fabulous partners in, in Sony uh, 10 with us. Uh, and we've, we've sort of struck a beautiful arrangement where it will be part of the top English sports channel, top Hindi sports channel, and it will be not behind paywalls as far as OTT is concerned. Uh, there might be an influx of sports regional channels also two regional channels, which will be shown in season one. Once that happened, uh, I think a lot of things sort of opened us, uh, you know, towards the world because there was not too much of news coming in in Jan and Feb this year, uh, mm. you know, from, from a sporting standpoint. And that is where we got a lot of uh, you know, inquiries from team ownership, to understanding where the partnerships can be worked out. So at this point in time, what we're looking at is uh, November this year, uh, post the World T20, is when we are looking at uh, launching Ultimate Coco Season 1. Uh, it will be a six-team affair, Season 1. Uh, it's, it's, it's going to be 21 days, double round robin, 34 matches, uh, 13 matches and four knockout. Um, and from the six teams, uh, we've, we've already taken care of, four teams are already in the kitty. Um, I'm, I'm happy to say that they're the big boys in the market. Uh, there are a few IPL franchise owners who are here. 
uh, there's a Bollywood uh, celebrity who's in this place. Uh, there's a Punjabi pop star who's uh, coming in. And uh, for the remaining two, we are talking to close to what seven to eight odd entities, private entities. The idea here, Karthik, has always been, I come back to your first question, which you asked me that, what is the first, you know, few, three things which you would like to see in Indian sports? I would like to see more new investors coming, right? The fact is that uh, all of us are part of the same ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But what has really disheartened me over the years is the fact that there have been so many leagues which have come, which have not done well, not because the sport was not good. It was also because of the fact that the financial modeling wasn't correct. And that literally irked off a lot of new investors which had actually wanted to come into the, you know, in the game and play the game. From that perspective, I've always wanted to bring in at least two to three new investors as, as team owners and give them an experience of their lifetime where they believe the sport can actually bring them value both uh, socially and commercially, right? So we're looking at an inclusion of two new uh, uh, never heard but big entities coming on board as team owners for the first time. And that really makes me very, very happy. Um, so this is where we are in terms of the six teams. We uh, also have inquiries more than that, but a seven team or an eight team French um, league for season one will become uh, sort of a happy headache for us because we will not get that much of stretch of a window from Sony uh, to conduct all those matches. So this is as far as the commercial standpoint is concerned. Of course, parallel process will happen as far as sponsorships you know, are, are concerned. So that is another area which will be taken care of. Uh, barring that, I think uh, the larger perspective, what we are actually focusing on is also the fact what I just mentioned from a TV production standpoint, it's very, very important how we bring that product on it. It has to be a compelling product and all our efforts and focuses are driven towards that. And then parallelly, what we are doing is we are uh, uh, we're working very closely with the Federation to, uh, due to the COVID scenario, there was a nationals which was supposed to happen in Osmanabad 24th to 29th of March, which got postponed because of Maharashtra COVID situation. But now we are looking at a May end uh, nationals, which is where all the players will be graded now uh, digitally from grade A, B, C to chaser, defender and all rounder. And there is a new inclusion which we have introduced called the Wazir, uh, who will be the strategist of every Coco team. He's the guy oh, who nice. changes everything. Now we are we have shortlisted <clears throat> 20 Wazirs of India who will be the highest paid in a team. And they are the, literally the game changers. They will be the Virat Kohli's and MS Dhoni's of that particular team. So we are grading all of them basis that, and we're creating grade one, grade two, grade three from a uh, player draft perspective. So there's a nice. lot happening from, from that perspective. Clearly, clearly. Uh, and the Wazir, they're going to be playing uh, strategists or non-playing strategists? I knew that question would come in as soon as I said Wazir. So Wazir is an absolute playing strategist. So what happens in, in Coco is that uh, whenever you get a co, you get up and there's a line in front of you and uh, you basically can go either left or right once you get a co, right? To catch the chaser. Now, a wazir will be wearing a separate jersey. What the wazir does is that at any given point in time, the wazir, when he gets a co, on his side of the flank, he can run both ways. Oh, nice. Nice. That's it. Now, it's a simple change. But when we tested this in Tal Katora a year and a half ago, we saw an escalation of close to 30 to 35% points being scored. So if the points earlier were being scored at around, say, 14 points a match, actually, and that time we were playing a nine-minute game. Now it is a seven-minute uh, inning. They've escalated to another level now in terms of points being scored, and the format has become more compelling. To add on, we've added sort of another perspective to this that Team Karthik and Team Tensing. So you play your first inning, I play my first inning. There's a half, there's a half time of three minutes, and then we play our respective second innings, like a test match. In either of the two innings, you can use two wazirs at a power play, which will be for 60 seconds. And that is a game changer. And that is where the coach comes into the picture saying that, okay, there are, and so imagine there are two wazirs of that seven people. So five people can run wherever, but 
the two wazis can run anywhere they want and that's where the game changes completely brilliant like a like a queen on a chessboard uh It's literally wazis yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> Next, that I, I love the X factor that that you bring in. Uh, then again, in, in closing, um, I'm assuming you're talking about uh, a men's league. Is that correct at this point? Yes, yes. How far away is a, is a women's league? I'm so I'm, I'm glad you brought this topic up. So I must tell you this story. When we were conceptualizing this, and uh, I was having a few drinks with my wife, and my wife said, uh, "Why aren't you looking at uh, including women?" and uh, i said uh, there will be a separate league uh, we will and she came up with this thought that uh, why did you do a mixed gender league and uh, it was a fabulous moment i still remember and i said wow so in that case coco will be world's first mixed gender league so i took that idea up and i started taking it to our stakeholders long time back so we had thought about something of a mixed gender league and to that effect we also got the top 20 women in tal katora about two years ago to test them while we tested them they were part of the same playing nine but uh, there was a slight bit of a gap in terms of once they were getting a co and they were getting up so there was a time when i thought that every team's wazir would be a girl so everybody will get equal opportunity and i could see that frame in front of me in the opening ceremony that there are guys standing and in the center there's a woman who is actually the game changer of the Team. It was a great thought, but due to certain other reasons, uh, from a from a safety standpoint, because I had actually gone ahead and signed indemnity forms from all the parents, from a touch standpoint, right? Uh, where do you get touch, and you should not be you know, taken to the court. So I got gotten all of that done. But I remember this one gentleman who actually gave me a a beautiful advice. He said that for a success of any league, you can get as many celebrities as many big corporate honchos and big entities to own team you can get the biggest of broadcast you can have a great business understanding with the broadcaster whether it's a slot deal whether it's a revenue share deal whether it's a equity stake deal but end of the day after the opening ceremony happens day 2 the format of the game is the king if that is not good it will never sell and that has stuck with me ever since so we of course chose not to get ahead with the mixed gender league so we've kept it a, to answer your question yes we are we are going ahead with a men's league at this point in time but surprisingly enough karthik there uh, has been an upsurge in interests of inquiry of a women's league since february and uh, i don't know why but uh, such is the case uh, there have been two big entities who got in touch with me saying that can we do the women's league before even the men's league has started and that's a rarity in india so i'm really really excited with that i really really look forward to uh, to that happening and like cricket i'm i'm pretty sure uh, given the history of the game like like you yourself mentioned um, i think there are more girls out there in schools playing coco than than there are boys um, yeah. so i think i think um, in in that spirit it will be wonderful to probably have both happening simultaneously as a sports fan i'm saying yeah um, or absolutely. or you know at least the women's league not not far away from the from the men's league i think uh, that that'll be beautiful to see yeah yeah absolutely absolutely Great. hopefully that he comes soon <laughs> i think we, we normally close the episode by asking our guest uh, what he or she is is watching reading or or, or listening to uh, with everything that's going on do you, do, you, do you, how do you how do you unwind do you have time to watch and if yes what are you watching i uh I haven't been watching too much to be honest I was watching the all or nothing episodes uh, typically from a content standpoint on Amazon and I just finished the uh, Formula 1 Drive to Survive season 3 which uh, which I love from a from a complexity standpoint and I've just uh, started watching the Arizona Cardinals and all or nothing from oh, yes. again from from a strategy perspective uh, typically that uh, Again, reading a lot of articles, but to, from a content standpoint, uh, it's it's been that kind of a phase where uh, a lot of time has been consumed from a legal uh, meetings, and uh, you know, with COVID being here, uh, a lot of time is consumed from that aspect. I can imagine. What 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 are since, since you watch, since you're talking about watching, what are some of the sports teams that you admire globally? It'll be funny, but you know, I really don't follow too much of world sports. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm not. 
I'm not too big a, a football fan or uh, a basketball fan. What I do like about uh, sports in general is the business side of it. So I look at the business numbers for all franchises, all NBA numbers, how ice hockey has been played, how is it being commercialized, um, how the NCAA being worked out in, in the US. Again, the point which I brought up is the collegiate sports in India. Um, how can you make a business out of that? Even the European League. So all, all sports, what I've always followed is typically their coaches and their managers and how the player transfers happen and what are the monies getting involved. Uh, purely from a from a commercial standpoint. Purely from and, and from that standpoint, which are some of the sports or leagues or teams which have, which have impressed you in terms of how they do it? Um, see, I think what has really impressed me is the overall ecosystem of football in LATAM, for example. Mm. The way they have, uh, you know, as they say, captured them young. Uh, what is the difference between a Brazil and India from an economic standpoint? We are the same. We are BRICS. We have the same per capita income at times, slightly larger. But for some reason, they have been constantly churning. Forget Brazil, but I'm saying the whole of Latin. Have been constantly churning world-class players in football, which I hope some joy India can't. Uh, you know, it's the same physicality, same everything. It's only because of the way they have actually built up their business model of getting them young, uh, getting the rights to the players showing their parents a dream and the parents believe in those dreams that's the that's the biggest thing and that's where the whole concept and logic of you know the conversation of sports complex is coming in and the infrastructure coming in how do we sort of enhance that chicken and egg story as to how do you teach the parents that you know there is a future ahead from a player standpoint that business model has always sort of been very very interesting for me and uh, i'm actually going to try something on those lines with coco by the way from a player agreement standpoint so we are we are looking at creating uh, a bank of images, uh, getting you know deals with Getty Images and striking deals for fantasy gaming and so all of that. You know, there's a larger perspective to Ultimate Coco, creating an ecosystem within an ecosystem. So yeah, those are the things. And then how do you sort of trade off players eventually? Coco is not going to be a trading uh, scenario, unlike football, where there a lot of international teams do player trading. It's not going to be trading because eventually the sport has to become larger in, in the world to, in order to facilitate trading or support trading. But the idea is that the business model should be created more viably for the player and it should be conducive for the player to earn some money from a younger age. And luckily, Coco applies to a younger audience as well. So there's a under 14, under 16, under 18 who are playing fabulous. And luckily, the league starts the way we have designed it is that 18 and onwards, uh, basically because of the juvenile law that that prevails in India, right? right? So yeah, that's that's something which is which is interesting um, from from that perspective. Excellent. Uh, it can and and who knows tomorrow? I think Coco would have uh, a 25 franchise in India 10 years from now and making grassroots, you know, part of the mandate. So you could possibly see a 20 franchise team a year long half a year long league big play. Beautiful. Uh, I think I'm, I'm being extremely honest here. As a sports fan, you know, with the way you, you explain it, I, I can't wait for this to begin. And uh, something tells me that very soon we'll probably, you know, if you have the time, uh, do a catch up after your, your, your first season to see, to see how, how, how things panned out. Right? Uh, thank you so much. It has been a, a, a fantastic chat. I'm really, really pumped for Coco after listening to it. And, uh, Wishing you all the success for this league. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karthik. Thanks for inviting me. It was wonderful. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thanks. Thank you so much. If you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IBM network. You can listen to us on the IBM podcast app or ibmpodcasts.com. You can also follow us on our social media. We are at IVM Podcasts on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want to reach out to me, I am the underscore Karthik. That's Karthik with an H on Twitter. And filter underscore coffee. That's coffee with a K on Instagram. Whether you're an established sports person or a budding one or simply a sports enthusiast, join us, Tanvi and Shlok. 
We are two passionate pro badminton players talking policy, mindset and everything sport. So tune in to the Millennial Athlete every Monday only on the IVM Podcast Network. Trust us, it's going to be lit. Hi, I'm Zarina Punawala, host of the Empowering Series podcast on the IVM Network. I happen to be a peak performance coach and leadership coach by profession and I'm here to share with you productivity tools, life altering techniques and real life hacks to help you achieve your maximum potential in everything you do, your relationships, professions, careers. So tune in every Monday to unleash your inner power. Be safe, be well, be empowered.